Hi guys, welcome to this week's Tech Tuesday. Um, we had a lot of requests after our piston uh, failure analysis to do some stuff on rod failure. So we decided to get some points together and I came up with what we consider probably the three major problems that happen when you have connecting rod failures. So there's a lot of things that can result in a connecting rod failure. It could, you know, we could, the list could go on and on, but we're just gonna purely look at things that would cause a rod failure itself, not some outside circumstances like a piston locking up in the bore or, or something that's just out of the ordinary. We're just gonna go look at things that we see that cause rod failures and how you can fix them, how you can look for ways to ensure that this doesn't happen on your engine build. And then we're gonna go over, you can see up here on the wall, we have some um, compressive and tensile loading FEAs on one of our H-beam rods. So you can kind of get an idea of where the stresses are at on the rods. But what we're first gonna talk about is just some of the simple failures. As you can see here, I got some basic failures out. So you guys could take a look at them and see what happens. So we'll probably go from we'll, we'll go from easiest to hardest here just to give you an idea when determining what went wrong. So obviously this is one of our Duramax diesel pistons and connecting rod combinations. And the history behind this part was I believe that it had an injector stick open in the engine and actually hydraulic the motor and you can see compress the beam of the rod. So that would probably be the number one thing we're gonna say would cause a failure in this instance is one, hydraulicing, you, can only, you can't compress the fluid if it doesn't light off. But we also see this happen in applications where the rod isn't designed for the cylinder pressures or the RPM. We get a lot of questions on how we design rods and what we do. So we take specific engineering data for your engine. So you're, we take your bore, your stroke, your RPM so we can calculate piston speed. Um, we look for cylinder pressure so that we can calculate how thick the actual blades and beam thicknesses on the rod need to be. So, you know, obviously a, a problem like this could happen is if you get a rod that's designed for 500 horsepower, low RPM, and then you try to hit it with nitrous, or you try to put it in an application that it's not designed for. I know out there on the internet, or eBay, or wherever it is, there's a lot of Carrillo rods for sale, and we answer a lot of questions on guys who find old NASCAR rods. Yes, it's a Carrillo rod, but heck, it wasn't designed to be put in a 454 cubic inch SP2 headed engine with a thousand horsepower of nitrous, so the rod is gonna fail. We make specific rods to handle different horsepower, different cylinder pressures, and different applications from sprint cars to um, turbocharged Supras, two JZs, GTRs, all these rods are engineered for those specific applications. So the number one thing in looking at uh, choosing a connecting rod is one, is it the right rod for my application? Has it been designed properly for my application to handle the stresses and loads of the environment you're gonna put it in? A road race connecting rod has different stresses on it than a drag race connecting rod, as well as a rod that is in a sprint car or an offshore boat. So there's a lot of factors that determine what is the, connect, the, connect, the correct connecting rod for your application. So we do see failures time to time for rods that are used in improper application. The perfect example of that would be an A-beam connecting rod that was designed for a naturally aspirated engine in a sport compact uh, well, in our sport compact category, we'll, so we'll say a Honda or an Acura type engine and then somebody adds a super a turbocharger on top of that and the rod buckles and folds because it wasn't designed for that application. It was designed for high RPM, naturally aspirated motor that's going to make, you know, three or four hundred horsepower and then a guy tries to make eight hundred to nine hundred on a turbocharger and the rod just wasn't designed for that. The second most common Failure that we see, if you look at this rod right here, a lot of times people will send a rod in like this and say, oh, your bolts failed, the rod flew apart. But what actually caused this problem on this rod, you can see it's got the black death on it, is actual oil. It ran out of oil. So either the bearing spun, there wasn't the proper clearance, something caused the rod bearing surface to heat up. And by heating up, it causes the rod to get weak. All the heat treat goes out of the rods, the bolts can't take the heat, and the bolts break and the rod flies apart and you end up with this common mistake right here. So you need to check your bearing clearances, you need to check your side clearances, because 
if you have oil starvation or lack of oil, this is what's going to happen. The rod can only take so much heat before it just loses all of its strength, and then you see a failure like you would see right here. So we see this happen really common. You can see the bluing. It's, I don't know if you can see it in the light, but you can see the bluing on the rod where the heat was transferring up the rod before the bolts finally gave out. And you have a mangled mess. So make sure that you check your bearing clearances. Make sure that they're the accurate bearing clearances for your intended application. Every engine builder likes a certain um, bearing clearance for the application. Some guys run them tight, some guys run them loose, but whatever your engine builder or you personally feel is the correct proper clearance of your bearing, make sure that you check every single rod because you never know if the cranks ground a little bit different and make sure you check your side clearance. A lot of people don't sometimes check the side clearance of the rod accurately and they can run together and you'll see some of the heat that you see on this rod right here. Or if you put a bearing in upside down and it runs up against the radius of the crank, that can cause this problem as well if you have an upper and lower um, connecting rod bearing. So that's one thing you need to look at. And then this one right here, it's good. It's in, it's in a lot of different pieces. This one took us a little while to figure out what happened. Um, but it basically, this rod is 12 years old and is 12 years old from a 410 Sprint car. So we checked some of the metal and stuff like that and, and you know the beam really didn't break. Like people think a rod just bare breaks in half, it doesn't happen. It got beat up pretty bad, but the bolts are in okay condition. Um, this one could just have seen its service life because this 410 Sprint car is probably the number one hardest engine application to have a connecting rod in other than an offshore boat. But you know, you can see here that it gets eat up, the rod got um, eaten up pretty bad. There's some heat marks in the rod, so this is one of those ones that was kind of a mystery. You can look and see the rods, if it's really old and, and you, you know, it's one of those things, how long are my rods good for? That's something that we really get asked a, a lot. And it, also, it all depends on application. There's so many cycles a rod can go through, heat cycles. Um, you know, we see rods that end up like this in sprint car applications as well as where guys um, fill the cylinders with uh, alcohol when they pull into the pits, they don't turn the fuel off. And if, the, if, it, you know, if, it, if it hydraulics the piston a little bit and you just get, like you can see on the end of this rod, you get a little bit of a bend, the rod might go out and run in the engine for another 25 or 30 laps, but your the rod is at an angle and it's trying to break itself in half. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're 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 leading your main event with one to go and it decides to exit itself out the engine. Um, it could have happened, you know, a race before and just put a little bit of a bend in the connecting rod. So you want to make sure that you get all the fluid out of a really high compression engine. We see this happen in uh, modifieds as well. Um, guys that go run out like an IMCA or USRA, USMTS modified, and they have a big jack that lifts the back of the car up. Um, they have an alcohol carburetor, they jack the back of the car way up to maybe change the gear or, or work on the shocks or springs, and it'll actually, bolt, the fuel will go over the vent tube into the engine, and once they start it up, it only takes a little bit on a 14, 15 to 1 compression engine to put a little kink in the rod and cause a hydraulic rod failure that isn't from the engine locking up to where it doesn't turn over because it, it, it'll turn over, but it will just put that slight bend in the rod and cause a problem. So there's a lot of things to consider. One thing we want to go over is the proper bolt torque, the bolt stretch and torque. We recommend specific bolt stretching your bolts. On some applications, you can't do that on an angled cap rod. But as you can see here, this is one of our, our bolt stretch gauges. And we recommend that you stretch each bolt in your connecting rod to ensure the, the, the proper clamp on the, the rod itself. The bolts, a lot of people talk about torque, but the actual stretching the rod bolt is what's going to give you the proper amount of clamp load in that bolt. We can throw torque numbers out left and right, but there's a lot of different lubes. There's a lot of different ways to do that. So we recommend in all of our rods to use our Carrillo bolt lube and a bolt stretch gauge to make sure that you get the, uh, the proper clamping load on that bolt. So, you know, we, a lot of the bolts are going to have the information on the bottom head of the bolt here to tell you exactly what it is. So if you have a bolt and you want to replace it, you can call us with the number on the, the end of the bolt 
and we can pretty much tell you the lot, the bolt, what it actually is. So if you have a question about torque, you can refer to our website, you can give us a call, send us an email, and we can figure out exactly what you got. So that's another reason we're going to look over here and we're going to talk about this stuff up here. The loads on the, I'm really excited to use this pointer, um, the loads on the end of the rod. <laughs> so here we're going to start. This is the compressive load of the rod. So you can see obviously the red areas are the highest stress loads and you know blue is good. You can see when the rod compresses you can see there's a stress area under the pin, transfers down the beam and around around the big end of the rod okay so this is where bolts are so important a lot of people don't really take the time and consideration to realize how important a connecting rod bolt is because these are the two things holding your your engine together as it's turning 9,000 10,000 rpm are the actual connecting rod bolts so it, it, getting the bolt stretched and torqued accurately are one of the the best ways you can ensure the longevity of your engine because if if the bolts are over yielded as as you torque them too much they'll fail and they'll fall out if you don't have the right stretch on them as well but you can see on the compressive load here around the big end how the actual loading of the rod transfers around the big end of the rod and that way a lot of people think on an h-beam rod you get a huge pressure spike down the center of the h-beam which isn't true so you get this load on the rod and it transfers around the bearing surface. So you can see there's a lot of stress in the actual bolt hole itself and around the, 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 the cap side as well. I'll be, let me turn that so you can see it. So this area is really important on the connecting rod as well. This is the spot face or radius that the bolt rides in. And if this is off center or off, you know, isn't in line with the actual bolt hole itself, it can cause a, a load on the actual cap and cause a failure as well. So and we make sure when we do all the probing, when we tap the, the rod, the holes and threads for the rod bolt, that they're all kind of put on center here along with the cap so we don't have any misalignment. Um, that's something that we've seen causes failures. Um, and you can see where the, the, the actual stress is on the, the actual location of the rod. A lot of times if the rod heats up you'll see a crack come right out of here um, when the bearing starts to fail or spins. Um, and you, what a lot of people don't realize, we get phone calls as well, we answer a lot of them, is a, you have a bearing tang location. I don't think it shows any tangs on these pictures, but you'll have a, a, a notch cut in the rod for the actual location of the bearing. All that does is locate the bearing from um, the, 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 the chamfer side, to the non-chamfer side to center it in the rod. It doesn't do anything to hold the actual bearing in place. The housing bores are actually honed to a specific size given to us by the bearing manufacturers to, and that, that crush on the bearing is what holds it from spinning, not the little tangs. So this is the compressive load. So this would be the down and then we're going to go to the tensile which would be the up and you can see how it changes. You can see how the cap changes color here as the, you know, effectively the rod is trying to pull itself apart at the top of the stroke when the you have all the weight in the, of the piston and the um, acceleration of the part moving um, up in the cylinder bore. So you can see the pin in becomes a more critical area. Um, this is where you know pin clearance be, can be really, really important. Um, we recommend, shoot, we put stuff out um, like a, we'll say a 927 pin, a thousandths uh, pin clearance would be good. Some guys run a little bit more. Um, if you run a DLC pin, you can run a little bit less, but that just gives you an eye, an area, a range. Every engine has a, a different happy place when it comes to actual pin clearance. Um, some of the engines that have really high oil temperatures require uh, more pin clearance there. And some of the, the, as the pin diameter goes down, then obviously the clearance goes down because it's based on the actual diameter size of the pin hole. So, that, that's something to consider. Um, you, you can see we put oiling holes up here. Some guys have oiling holes at the bottom. It's just, you know, most of the old oiling holes we do are on the top, but we want to make sure the pin gets plenty of lubrication so it doesn't lock up in the bore. If the pin doesn't have enough lubrication and it locks up in the, the pin end, um, you're going to see a, a, a rod that actually, when it locks up, it's going to spin the bushing 
and then on top of that it'll have the piston lock up in the bore and if the piston locks up in the bore and can't move then you're going to see failures where the rod breaks off right here so you know there's a there's one of those things that too too tight a pin clearance is bad and too loose is is bad too because it'll rattle you just have to you know check your engines after you get a lot of temperature in them or running conditions and see what makes that engine seem to perform the best you know some guys tell us that looser pins make more horsepower some guys don't want to have the pistons move around on the actual rod and pin itself so they run them a little bit tighter that's a personal preference but you can see how the the actual load changes on the actual the, the rod itself this is probably the most critical area on a connecting rod when it comes to the actual strength this this dimension from here to here from off the big end to the side of the rod and so that thickness right there is where it carries all the load on the rod so a lot of guys we get rods in here where they'll notch this part way out right here to clearance for a camshaft that's not the best way of doing things we we want it you can see that that's where there could be a potential failure on the strap thickness right there so there's a lot of different things to consider you, you know it's you know we're giving you the crash course on what to look for on a connecting rod but there are a lot of different things to consider as well but just remember when you check everything on your rods when you get them our rods come with a spec sheet they're going to tell you what bolts are in them what you should torque them to properly what the side you know you want to make sure once again you check the side clearance between the rods you want to make sure you have the adequate adequate amount of side clearance you want to make sure that the pin clearance is right you can check the housing bores and make sure they're correct but most of all you want to make sure that you avoid the simple mistakes that can cause failures um, the simple things are what eat you up when it comes to building an engine if you can go through and double check and make sure all these pro all these steps are taken serious really really seriously because like i said before the connecting rod bolt is the only thing holding that piston and connecting rod in so it's very very it's a, a real critical component to making your engine last and and work its best do, do we have any questions that anybody would like answered no no questions okay well um, thanks for tuning in this week if you have questions you can answer ask them online send us an email at cp carillocom we'd be more than happy to answer anything that you might have as far as a question and and help us design a rod for your application so we do plenty of plenty of custom rods and we and along with our shelf stock as well thank you again and have a great day